Pre-labor rupture of membrane, PROM, refers to rupture of amnion and corium before the onset of labor. However, if it happens before 37 weeks, it's called preterm PROM. Preterm PROM complicates about 3% of all pregnancies and results in 30% of all preterm births. And the median latency is 7 days. Latency is the time between rupture of membrane and birth. Prior history of preterm PROM is an important risk factor. The risk of recurrence is 16 to 30% compared to 3% in women with no prior history of preterm PROM. Risk factors of preterm labor are also risk factors for preterm PROM, such as prior history of preterm birth, cervical insufficiency, placental abruption, uterine overdistension, and infection. Complications of preterm PROM include preterm birth and its complications such as respiratory distress, intraventricular hemorrhage, periventricular leukomalacia, infection, and necrotizing enterocolites. Other complications include cordoprolapse, prolapse, neonatal or maternal sepsis, placental abruption, oligohydramnios with its complications such as pulmonary hypoplasia, limb defects, and the cord compression. Assessment requires history, examination, and investigation. The patient presents with a history of gush of fluid per vagina. Ask about associated symptoms such as abdominal pains or bleeding. Review obstetric notes to identify gestational age. The best method is early pregnancy ultrasound to also identify obstetric complications such as preeclampsia and diabetes. Ask about risk factors such as history of prior preterm PROM or cervical surgery. During the examination, assess vital signs. Fever may indicate chorioamnionitis. Hypotension and tachycardia may indicate placental abruption. Abdominal examination identify fundal height and fetal lie, may detect abdominal tenderness and auscultate fetal heart rate. Abdominal tenderness may indicate chorioamnionitis or placental abruption. Abnormal fetal heart rate may indicate cord prolapse. Then perform a speculum examination to visualize pooling of amniotic fluids, bleeding, cervical dilatation, and exclude cord prolapse. Avoid digital examination unless delivery is thought to be imminent. Digital examination decreases the latency period and increases the risk of neonatal sepsis. During speculum examination, if pooling of amniotic fluid is observed, don't perform any diagnostic test and start management as a case of preterm PROM. If pooling is not observed, perform testing for either insulin like cross factor binding protein 1 or placental alpha microglobulin 1. Both are proteins present in high concentration in amniotic fluids. BAMJ1, for example, is tested by Amnishur. A sterile swab is inserted into the vagina for one minute, then placed in a vial containing a solvent for one minute, and then an Amnishur test strip is dipped into the vial. The test result is revealed by the presence of one or two lines within the next 5 to 10 minutes. One line means a negative test result. Two lines means a positive test result. No lines means invalid test. If the test result is positive, this supports the diagnosis. However, the test should be used in conjunction with clinical finding to ensure accurate diagnosis because other causes can increase these proteins in vaginal fluids, such as vaginal bleeding, infection, or cervical manipulation. On the other side, if the test is negative and no amniotic fluid is observed, preterm PROM is unlikely. Advise the woman to return for reassessment if there are any further symptoms suggestive of preterm PROM or preterm labor. Don't use nitrazine to diagnose preterm PROM. 
and they don't perform a diagnostic test if labor is established, I mean the cervix is dilated 4 cm or more. The role of ultrasound assessment of amniotic fluid in supporting the diagnosis is unclear. In conclusion, the diagnosis of PPROM is made by a history suggestive of ruptured membrane, followed by a sterile speculum examination demonstrating a pooling of fluids in the posterior fornix. If no amniotic fluid is observed, test for IGF binding protein 1 or BAMJ1 to guide the diagnosis. Regarding management, delivery is indicated if there is active labor, non assuring fetal heart rate, or chorionionitis. In the absence of complication, patient can be managed conservatively. Inpatient care is indicated if delivery seems imminent. The decision to offer outpatient care should be individualized, taking into account past obstetric history, support at home, distance from hospital, and the markers of delivery latency. On the other side, ACOG guideline has a clear-cut recommendation. It advises hospitalization for all cases. Because latency is frequently brief, infection may present suddenly, and the fetus is at increased risk of umbilical cord compression. Admit to monitor the mother and the fetus, administer drugs, and deliver in a timely manner. Monitor the mother for features of chorioamunitis, which include lower abdominal pain, abnormal vaginal discharge, fever, malaise, reduced fetal movement, increased white blood cells, and CRP. Take care, white blood cells increase after steroid therapy. It increased 24 hours after steroid therapy and return after three days. Perform non-stress test every day to monitor fetal condition. Provide erythromycin 250 mg oral every 6 hours for 10 days or until established labor, whichever is sooner. This reduces chorioamnionitis, prolonged latency, and improve neonatal outcome. On the other side, ECOG guideline recommend 2 days of intravenous ampicillin and erythromycin, followed by 5 days of oral amoxicillin and erythromycin. In Parkland Hospital, they start with azithromycin 1 gram upon admission and the ampicillin intravenous for 2 days, followed by amoxicillin oral for 5 days. Offer corticosteroid between 24 and 34 weeks and consider them between 34 and 36 weeks. Either 2 doses of beta 12 mg intramuscular 24 hours apart or 4 doses of dexamethasone 6 mg intramuscular 12 hours apart. Magnesium sulfate is given for established preterm labor or planned birth within 24 hours to reduce the risk of cerebral palsy. It is offered between 24 and 30 weeks and considered between 30 weeks and 34. The dose is 4 grams loading dose, followed by 1 gram per hour infusion until birth or for 24 hours, whichever is sooner. Tocolysis is not recommended in case of preterm birth. Regarding timing of birth, offer expectant management until 37 weeks if there is no contraindication to expectant management. Vaginal delivery is safe in case of cephalic presentation. However, in breach of presentation, consider caesarean section. If no other risk factor, offer either CTG or intermittent auscultation for fetal monitoring. Avoid fetal scalp electrodes and fetal blood sampling before 34 weeks. Offer intravartum antibiotic prophylaxis for GPS.
wait at least 60 seconds before clamping the cord. If maternal and fetal conditions are stable and position the baby at or below the level of placenta before clamping the cord.